Hi, and welcome to Solar Power. On this episode, I'm going to show you some upgrades George and I made to our solar project. Now, if you haven't seen our first two videos, you might be a little lost, but it'll be fun anyway. So come on, let's head up to the roof and see where we made our first upgrade. For those of you who saw the first video, you may remember that we have four Kyocera panels, each capable of producing 185 watts on the main roof. And behind me, we had two Mitsubishi panels, each capable of producing 165 watts on the shed roof. And although you couldn't see them, I told you there were nine Harbor Freight panels here, all wired together, only capable of producing 135 watts. We replaced them with these two Kyocera panels, each capable of producing 185 watts, just like the ones on the main roof. Now we wired these in a series, and what does that mean? Well, if you remember from Solar 101, you connect the positive of one panel to the negative of the other, and then you have a positive and negative lead going to the charge controller. What that does is it raises the voltage but keeps the amperage the same. So now these are acting as one panel at 48 volts, because they're normally 24 volts each, 8 amps. Now they're acting as one 48 volt panel at 8 amps. And what that does is lower amps, higher voltage, allow us to have a smaller wire running to the shed, which is easier to work with and more cost effective. Now, if you want to know more about series and parallel wiring, please watch the first video. There's plenty of information. Now let's head down to the shed and see what upgrades we made there. One quick stop here before we head down. Since these two pairs of panels are wired slightly different than the others, I want to explain to those who missed the first video. The two pairs are wired in a series, just like the other pairs. But these two pairs are then wired in parallel. That means the positive lead from one pair is connected to the positive of the other pair and the negative to the negative. When you wire this way, the voltage stays the same and the amps go up. So now these two 48 volt, 8 amp pairs are now acting like a single 48 volt, 16 amp panel. Since the amperage is higher, we did have to run a slightly larger gauge wire from these panels to the shed. If you use too small of a gauge of wire, you will lose some of your power to heat. And if the wire is way too small, it can get hot and possibly melt, causing a short circuit. Also, the longer the run of wire, the larger gauge you will need. Again, you can use your favorite search engine to find calculators to help you determine the correct gauge for your system. Okay, now we can head down to the shed. The three arrays we have all come into this combiner box. What that does is it brings all the arrays together and then we have a positive negative coming out and going to the charge controller. Now we can turn off each individual array with our DC circuit breaker. From the combiner box, the wires go to our charge controller. Ours is a midnight solar multi-power point tracking charge controller. Now what that does over a normal one is it helps regulate the power coming from the solar panels if part of your array is shaded or, like us, you have arrays that are slightly different or panels made from different manufacturers. Now for those of you who didn't see one of the first two videos, the way the charge controller works, there's actually three stages. The first stage is bulk. When your batteries are less than 80% full, it goes into bulk. And what that does, it tries to put in as much power or amperage it can into the batteries. Once they get to be about 80% full, it's, the batteries start to push back. So what do we need? We know that when voltage means pressure. So what it does is it raises up the voltage and lowers the amperage to get those last little bit of power into the batteries. Then, once they are full, it goes into a float stage. And what that does, it just trickle charges the batteries because even when you're not using them, they lose power. Our charge controller then it hooks up to this box here, which is just a circuit breaker, so that we can turn this off, turn our panels off, and isolate the charge controller should we have to work on it. Now, from here, it goes out to our battery bank. Now let's go take a look at that, because we made some upgrades there. Our original battery bank consisted of four golf carp type batteries. We wanted to double our capacity, so now we have eight Energizer golf carp type EGC2 6 volt 210 amp hour batteries. Since our new inverter is 24 volts, we have to wire the batteries to match. So we wired four in a series, and if you remember, that means positive to negative of each battery, and then a positive and negative lead coming out. So you take the six volts, 
and the voltage goes up since we're wiring in a series. So now we get 24 volts. And the amp hours stay the same, 210 amp hours. So we did that twice because we have two banks of four batteries at 24 volts, 210 amp hours. Then we wire those in parallel, meaning the positive of one bank goes to the positive of the other, the negative to the negative. So what that does is that keeps the voltage the same, still 24, but it doubles the amp hours. So now we have 420 amp hours. Now if you take 24 volts times 200 and, or 420 amp hours, that's basically 10,000 watts or 10 kilowatts of power. Now you don't want to deplete your batteries all the way, so you only want to go about 50%. So that gives us about 5 kilowatt hours of usable power at night. One last thing here before we move on. To charge the batteries, we have a positive and negative lead coming from the charge controller going to the batteries. Then we have a positive and negative lead coming off the batteries going to the inverter. Now these wires are of heavy gauge, and in our case a 4 over because they have to be able to take the full current of the batteries. Now you'll notice that we place them on opposite ends of the battery pack and that's to make sure the batteries are charged and depleted in an even manner. So now let's go into the shed and see how it hooks up to the inverter. From the battery bank we have two wires coming in, a positive and a negative. Now one of the upgrades we made, we used to have a fuse here to protect our inverter in case of a catastrophic uh, short circuit. But every time we wanted to work on the inverter, we had to disconnect it. So what we did is we replaced it with a 250 volt DC breaker. Now I keep mentioning DC when I say breakers, because when you're working with DC, you want to make sure the breakers are made for DC, because it's not safe to use an AC breaker in a DC application. From the breaker, the positive wire goes to the inverter, and then the black coming from the batteries also goes to the inverter. Now this is also an upgrade. We have a Magnum sine wave inverter. Now what's a sine wave inverter? The sine wave is the, pa the wave of the electricity coming through the wires. And a pure sine wave inverter like we have here uh, is good when you're working with electronic equipment like digital clocks and computers and laptops. It keeps the power at the correct wave. It's also helpful when you're starting up large motors. It can just provide more watts at one time. They cost a little more, but they're well worth the extra cost. Now, this is a 4,000 watt inverter. We replaced a 12 volt, 2,000 watt inverter with this one. 24 volts, 4,000 watts. This way we can have more power. It can also do 220 volts, although we don't have it wired that way. Now, from here, I don't know if you can see the back, but we have two wires that now are 120 going to our, our breaker panel, just like you have in your home. Now, when we were out at the battery bank, I was telling you that we have five kilowatts of usable power from our batteries. Well, actually, it's only about 4 kilowatts, and the reason is, when you're converting from DC to AC, the inverters lose anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. Another upgrade we made is we added this wireless access point. What this does, this communicates with our wireless router in the house. Our charge controller is connected by an Ethernet cable to our wireless access point. This way, we're able to monitor our charge controller from our computer inside the home. Before I sign off, there's a couple questions that I get asked quite often. One is, how much does the solar system cost, and what's the best setup for my situation? Both of those are very tough to answer, because costs can vary greatly depending whether you're buying online or buying in your geographical area. Also, it's hard to uh, analyze what you actually need without being there. The best way to do it is use your favorite search engine and just look it all up. There's plenty of answers out there, and a lot of people have already done it and you're bound to find the answers that you're looking for. So there you have it, folks. And even though our solar system, which our Earth belongs to, is being downgraded, Pluto is no longer a planet, our solar system here at the house has been upgraded. Well, that's all for now, and we hope to see you again on Solar Power. I'm Andrew Shimshot, saying good night.